Welcome to The Art of Medicine, the program that explores the arts, business, and clinical aspects of the practice of medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Wilner. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Frank Veith. Dr. Veith is a renowned vascular surgeon who recently published a book, The Medical Jungle. Dr. Veith has had a long and storied medical career. I was particularly intrigued to speak with him about the evolution of vascular surgery over the last 50 years when I learned that he graduated medical school the year I was born. I particularly wow. appreciated this quote from his book, The Art of Medicine Cannot Be Taught from a Book. But before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsor, locumstory.com. If you're considering locum tenens, either full-time or on the side, you probably have a question or two, or 20. Fortunately, locumstory.com has the answers you need. It's packed with unbiased information and advice from physicians like you. Locumstory.com has nothing to sell. It's simply a resource for information. You'll find super handy tools that let you see locum's trends for your specialty, compare different locum's agencies, and there's even a quiz to help you decide if locums is right for you. Locumstory.com is the perfect place to start if you want to learn more about locums. Okay, and now without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Frank Veith to the Art of Medicine. Dr. Veith, thanks for joining us. Pleasure to be here. You know, your your book crossed my path. And I said, you know, I'm going to read this book, The Medical Jungle. And then when I started reading about you, uh, I don't think this is a secret. So by my calculation, you are 92 years old. Is that right? Getting close. All right. So, <laughs> But I deny it. All right. And, uh, but, you know, uh, well, one of the questions I'm going to ask you along the way and and i read in your book there's some testimonials at the end from the, some of the many many uh fellows you know in vascular surgery that you've uh taught uh in the operating room and in research lab and I, more than one of them comments on uh, your uh, energy and ability to uh i wouldn't say multitask you know, because I don't believe in multitasking. You can only do one thing at a time, but your ability to do many, many things one after the other and, uh, and efficiently. Uh, so, um, any secrets there that we should know about? Not really. I mean, uh, you sort of go the way the wind blows and, and, uh, take advantage of opportunities. Uh, but the, the reason I wanted to write this book was that, um, everybody thinks medicine is immune from some of the uh, foibles and, and malign characteristics of human nature. And, and it really isn't. Uh, I mean, some of the obstacles we faced are really based on some of the very malign characteristics that human beings having. Lust for power, uh, self-interest, uh, rather than group interest, uh, greed, and even jealousy. And uh, for young people going into any profession, and particularly medicine or surgery, you have to realize that you're going to encounter some of these uh, disappointing characteristics of human beings, usually your superiors, but often your colleagues, and uh, how to overcome these and still achieve your goals was one of the reasons I wrote the book. Right. So I wish I had read that book a long time ago <laughs> because I, I wish I would... realized all this. <laughs> I never did. Uh, I had a few run-ins along the way with people who I, you know, as fellow physicians who I thought would have my career and development in as it's part of their best interest uh, but it wasn't true. And, you know, I was kind of a naive, uh, and I think many people that go into medicine are naive. They want to do good. I mean, they, you know, they can make more yeah, money I mean, on Wall Street, but they want into medicine because it's exciting and you can help people. Directly. Yeah. And, and you think if you do a good job, take good care of your patients, write a few good articles here and there, you'll be rewarded by your, the people you're working with or for. 
unfortunately, it doesn't always work that way. And I, I wasn't sure whether I should call your book an autobiography because it, it left a lot of things out in in your life. Although obviously, I mean, it covers a span of I think more than fifty years of, and it's and it's a nice chronicle of a vascular surgery because I remember as a medical student when aortic grafts were a new big thing that uh, instead of doing the open surgery, which was usually uh, not successful and a big disaster that you could slip up. In fact, um, I think it's fair to say a close family friend was a physician who became the Dean of Brown Medical School. Right. And he had vascular disease. And I remember he went when I think I was in medical school at that time, he went to Mass General to have this newfangled procedure, which was an aortic graft. Um, endograft. Or, or endograft. Over. I don't know. They slip something up the femoral right, artery right, right. and it expands like a cage and rather than the open surgery. But this was like a big deal and because it was a new thing and and you were one of the pioneers of that technology absolutely well we we did the first uh aortic endograft in the united states with the argentinian dr juan perotti who did the first one in the world and uh we of course became we're very close friends and so forth but the irony was when we first introduced it even to the superstars at mass general they thought we were all crazy and there was a great deal of resistance. Uh, I happened to be fortunate to be president of a couple of societies as this was evolving and as, as we were doing our original work. And so I was able to promote it. And I thought I would be regarded as the Messiah leading vascular surgery into the new age, the promised land. But instead, I was regarded as a pariah who was spoiling all these good open surgical vascular procedures. Right. In, in other words, you were putting your colleagues out of work is what it well, seemed like, I, right? I, I didn't want to put them out of work. I wanted to let them know that this was happening because if they embraced it, learned it as I did, and I wasn't young at the time, anybody could learn it. But instead, we encountered really rather widespread resistance. And it was only after somewhere between five and 10 years after we started talking about it and writing about it, that even Mass General thought that it was something that uh, they should embrace. And they did, as did everybody else, ultimately. Eventually. Yeah. You, you know, I be, just before I, I read your book, I, I read another book uh, for a fellow, Dr. Ola Sogstad, who I interviewed uh, a few weeks ago, and his program will have come out by the time ours does. And he's he's in his 70s. And in, I was reading the two books actually more or less simultaneously. And I could, and there were these themes. It, you guys have to meet because you encountered similar experiences. His concept when he was a young man uh, he decided to be a pediatrician and he wanted to help newborns. He felt drawn to the right. most helpless of patients, but he had this idea. And at that time, resuscitation was a hundred percent oxygen. That's what everybody had done. You have a newborn not breathing, which apparently is fairly common. You know, you give them a slap, you got to stimulate them and maybe they don't breathe. You resuscitate them with a hundred percent oxygen. But he had this idea that, you know, a newborn lungs kind of delicate, Maybe a hundred, and there's these free radicals. Maybe a hundred percent oxygen isn't the way to go. Well, it turns out he was right. Yeah, and it took him thirty years of research and presentations, and he encountered huge resistance. People thought he was crazy when he gave uh, less than a hundred percent oxygen in, in a proper study. He was con uh, accused of child abuse. That uh, I mean, all of these. Uh, the system, the culture did not want to accept this. Now it's international recommendations. You don't give 100% right. oxygen. But all, all because he was 
stubborn <laughs> you know? persistent. and persistent. persistent yeah. Well, for no glory, by the way, I mean, there was no glory in proving everybody wrong. Uh, he was just trying to help uh, these newborns. And when I read your story, it's like, gee, here he is, you know, he's got this great idea. We don't have to have morbidity and mortality from these big operations, because as you point out in your book, many of these patients have very severe comorbidities. They, in fact, the first patient, I think, had COPD, right? He could barely they, breathe. They all do. Yeah, he had right. heart disease and lung disease. And sure. uh, so they're not, they're, they're the last people in the world you want to do a big surgery on. And some of them you couldn't do big surgery on. They just wouldn't tolerate it. They couldn't be put to sleep, et cetera, et cetera. So that was what we started with. And the, the shocking thing, when we did these cases, not only the aneurysms and the aortic surgery, but uh, endografts elsewhere, they worked in otherwise hopeless situations. And we presented this or tried to present it. Of course, it was always rejected from the major medical meetings, surgical meetings. But when we presented it, nobody believed us. They said we were either crazy or lying. And that was the same way Perotti was treated uh, and the same way we were treated at the beginning. And, uh, and I gave a presidential address to the big vascular society, the Society for Vascular Surgery on Charles Darwin and how we had to evolve if we were gonna survive as a species. And uh, one of the tenets of that, which I was correct on, was that we had to become uh, aware of and embrace these endovascular techniques that up to that time, surgeons were really disregarding and not getting involved with. You know, reading the story, it also reminded me, I, I read a very poignant essay uh, written by a surgeon who was, I guess, my age or so, who was faced with learning laparoscopic techniques. Same that, thing. That was the new thing. And you have to kind of operate through, I, I don't know if you actually use a microscope, but a window, there's a video screen. Well, video cameras and instruments introduced through ports in the abdomen. And uh, obviously now almost everything imaginable in general surgery is done through these less invasive uh, laparoscopic techniques. And he realized that using his hands he was so you know running the bowel using his hands was so much a part of what he had done his whole professional life that uh he uh he could not evolve and uh it it was not possible for him at that stage in his career to adopt this new technology which as you say is now just standard of care you know it's no it was Absolutely. a newfangled thing right it was a newfangled yeah. thing but yeah. It's now standard uh, of care. And what about endovascular approaches? Is that standard of care now? In, in I'd say 85 to 90% of vascular lesions that are treated are now treated endovascularly. There's still a need for open surgery. Uh, maybe it's 10%, maybe it's 15%, but most lesions are now treated endovascularly. And when we started advocating this, the problem was finding cases for young vascular surgeons to train on. Now, the problem is finding open surgical cases for them to train on because they're, all the cases are done, or most of the cases are being done endovascular. But it, it, you know, it's just, it's human nature to not want to change. It's human nature when somebody else comes up with something new, you downplay it because it interferes with what you're comfortable with or you're jealous that you didn't think of it first. Um, and, and the theme of the book is, is basically how to progress and counter these negative traits of human nature, which occur in medicine, just as they do in any other profession, whether it's law, whether it's business, uh, whether it's politics. If you've got something that's working, people aren't gonna like you and they're not going to accept it. That's just the way many people think, most people think. Uh, now that endovascular 
therapy is standard of care. Do you ever run into uh, any of those uh, critics no. from the old days sure. or, ha or have you outlived them all? <laughs> no, well, most of them had to retire or they passed away or went out of business because ultimately today, if you're not trained in the endovascular techniques in vascular surgery, you're not trained. The issue, one of the issues is that there are other specialties that are competent in endovascular techniques, notably interventional cardiologists and interventional radiologists. When I gave this presidential address on Darwin, I advocated for three things. One of them was to work with these other specialists. That never worked because of ego issues and so forth. The second thing I advocated was that vascular surgery become an independent specialty, not controlled by general surgery or cardiac surgery because I felt this endovascular separated us in surgery and that we should have an independent specialty. That failed and is still failing. We're still vascular surgery in the United States is still not an independent specialty. That was one of my uh, things that I embraced and fought for that never succeeded, still hasn't succeeded uh, for a variety of bad reasons, but that's the way it is. And uh, the third thing of course was embracing endo. And that I, I was correct on, that worked. And, and ultimately my predictions for the future were surpassed. I mean, I was thought to be crazy when I said 40 to 70% of lesions in the vascular tree will be treated endovascularly. I was wrong. It's much more than that now. And, and the things that I'm seeing now that some of my trainees and younger colleagues can do amazes even me. They, they can do things I never dreamed of being able to do. Of course, we made our own grafts. And, and now industry is producing grafts that far surpass anything that we could do. I want to talk about one episode I read in the book that just resonated with me because it was so uh, it's kind of convoluted and ironic and uh, classic that uh, for surgeons, I guess, in training, uh, in order to qualify, they have to do a certain number of operations and to prove that they have the experience. So there was a point where you were kind of gung-ho with this endovascular thing, which was great, at least according, you know, ultimately. Ultimately uh, proved right. But in the short run, the, whoever is the accrediting uh, committee uh, criticized your residents because they hadn't done enough open operations uh, because you weren't doing them anymore unless you absolutely had to. So, so I think they didn't, they didn't accredit their training. Is it something like well, that? Well, we had, we had problems. First of all, we were in a, I don't want to say second rate, but a less prominent institution in the Bronx in New York city, which had many, many very well-known and prestigious institutions, Cornell, Columbia, NYU, Mount Sinai, et cetera. And, and so our training program came under scrutiny and was placed on probation because we weren't doing enough open aortic surgery because we were able to use stents and balloons and treat most of those patients endovascularly. And of course, we still did a lot of open surgery and uh, we ultimately overcame that. And many of my trainees have surpassed me in their abilities and, and uh, achievements. And that, that too is in the book and it's very gratifying to see that. I'll you be had quickly it. forgotten uh, because nobody lives on in, in medicine except maybe Semmelweis or a few uh, pastor. You know, there are, are people that, that last in, in reputation, but most doctors are forgotten, but their progeny live on and can continue to maintain their achievements and then surpass them. You had a nickname when uh, you were uh, teaching residents and fellows. Uh, I believe it was a white shark. Yeah, the great white shark. I mean, I, I was never malignant. I was never a tough guy, but I was very um, 
concerned about having things go just right because the patients would would benefit. And so I wasn't exactly a comedian or hail fellow well met when it came to to training people. I was pretty tough on getting them to do it our way. There are many other chiefs of service that were more malignant. You know, they torture their young people. I, I never did that. I embraced them as I used to joke about it saying, when you train with me, you're gonna be closer to me than you will be to your wife because we live together, we work together. And um, that gave rise to this uh, nickname of being a great white shark. Right. When, I remember when I was in medical school, and I don't know if it's still this way. I mean, the surgeons always had the uh, most difficult uh, and time, more time in the hospital than anyone else. And uh, the joke was uh, the only problem with being on call every other night was that you missed half the cases. Right. Right. That's true. You and know? and uh, yeah, we were we regarded ourselves as the sewer workers we in vascular surgery because we were always there in the in the hospital doing an emergency or taking somebody back to the OR because they needed to be reoperated on if your first procedure failed. And nowadays, taking somebody back or readmitting them is regarded as a mark of bad care. It's mm -hmm. not. It's a mark of good care because you've got to keep doing it till you get it right. And usually that produced a good outcome or a better outcome. Well, let's switch gears for a minute and talk about one of your other projects uh, that I believe is still ongoing, uh, the Veith Symposium. Tell me about that. Uh, one of my predecessors, a guy named Henry Hamavici, started a very small meeting in New York City 50 years ago and uh, had maybe 10 faculty members and less than 100 people came to the meeting. And when he retired, I took over that meeting because he was the previous chief of service at my institution. And we happened to be lucky about a lot of things. Uh, and, and we were able to grow the meeting to now being probably the largest vascular surgery meeting in the world, uh, getting up to, before COVID, up to 5,000 attendees. Uh, and, and the meeting has, has has grown and prospered and gained reputation for a couple of reasons. One is it's in New York, it's easy for everybody to get to from overseas. Uh, secondly, we early on embraced industry uh, as being equal partners in our quest to provide good care. Uh, whereas heretofore, the doctors were guided the industry people as second-class citizens to be exploited for funding, but not regarded as equal partners. And early on, we embraced them and regarded them as equal partners because if they can't make good devices that enable us to do what we do better, we fail. Plus they have the money and the engineering experience to invest in making these good devices. So we, we felt that they're uh, unlike many others and government and institutions, universities, we felt that we should have good relationships with industry and they with us because what they did was 90% of it was beneficial to society. You know, there were a few instances where there were conflicts of interest. Doctors did things they shouldn't have done to promote products that might not be as good as they should be. But 90% of the relationship between industry and doctors is positive. It results in better care, better outcomes for patients. And we popularized that view early on. So we got the support of industry. They deserve to market their good devices and uh, they should have the ability to make, to make a profit. That's what business is all about. It's not evil. Uh, I find your spirit of collaboration very inspiring, Dr. Veith. I think, uh, you know, even now, in fact, there, I think it more so now there is this uh, 
sort of sentiment that uh, somehow the pharmaceutical companies are evil and they shouldn't be allowed on campus. You know, you shouldn't talk to drug reps. I've never understood that. Yes, there that is. It's, it's absolute nonsense. When we were the leaders in endovascular aneurysm repair, I always wanted an industry rep in the operating room with me because he might have seen something that I didn't know at another institution and he might be able to advise <clears throat> advise me just as my partners and colleagues would so we could have a better outcome. And uh, this this business of worrying about the conflict of interest is, is in my opinion, nonsense. Doctors do so much on the phone and, and they don't get compensated for it. Uh, other lawyers, for example, charge by the minute. Doctors may be on the phone for many minutes. It's free. It's part of the, the game. And industry also has a right to market good, good products because they're basically beneficial for patients. Uh you know, healthcare is uh, challenging, and I I think everything's challenging. Life need, is challenging. We need and all the partners we can get. Just like any other profession, and and the other thing about our meeting, we were very lucky. In addition to being in New York, we early on embraced the idea of the short talk. Mm. We and the reason we did it is I watched television and they'd have these secretaries of state defense vice presidents on television, they let them talk for two or three minutes. And then they said, that's it, we'll have you back. So we had all these good people, good doctors from around the world. I wanted to get more of them on our program because they all had something to contribute. So I came up with the idea of five minute talks. Heretofore, their talks were 10 minutes, 20 minutes, five minute talks, and that's it. You can present your life story in five minutes. You can present the key things in five minutes. So that enabled us to bring more uh, specialists to the meeting outside of vascular surgery, cardiologists, radiologists, the vascular medicine people. We brought them all together and, and we ended up with a pretty good meeting. Uh, which is an annual meeting uh, still ongoing, yes? Still ongoing. This is our 50th year. Uh, we, we took a hit because of COVID. Uh, we missed one year completely. We canceled. But we had another meeting in uh, 2021. We moved out of New York City because it was a hotbed for COVID. We moved to Orlando. We had over 2,000 people came. It was a very successful meeting. Um, and it brought people back together. Nobody got sick. And then last year, we had probably close to 4,000, maybe 3,500. Uh, so it was a smaller meeting because of travel restrictions. The Chinese couldn't come. Other people couldn't come. This year, we're hoping, fingers crossed, that we'll be back to our, our usual and, and have a really big meeting, which will be successful. Let me ask you a question. You've had uh, decades of experience in academic medicine. Uh, what would you change in the training of students or residents or how could it be improved? I think in vascular surgery, which I can talk about, we should be a separate specialty. And there's so much to vascular surgery now that we should be able to subspecialize. We should have people who are experts in aortic repair, experts in open surgery, experts in carotid, experts in limb salvage, experts in venous, experts in medical treatment. We can't subspecialize as a subspecialty. And vascular surgery, unfortunately, nobody knows what we do. If you go to a cocktail party, <laughs> some layperson says, what, are, what do you do? Say, I'm a vascular surgeon. They say, oh, you take care of varicose veins or you take care of the heart. I say, no, no. We don't do that. We take care of blood vessels. It's quite different. It's a big field. Everybody has vascular disease to some extent. That's the bad news. The good news is most of it doesn't need to be treated aggressively. It can be treated conservatively. And the vascular surgeons, in our, my opinion, 
are best able to take care of vascular disease patients because they can take care of the open part, the endo part, endovascular part, the medical part. They know the natural history of the disease. They don't do it as a uh, add on to another specialty like radiology or cardiology. Some of the cardiologists that are involved in what we do are outstanding. They do, they do the same things we do. Some of them even do it as well or better. But the vast majority of cardiologists take care of the heart. And yet they feel that they're obligated, and maybe they are, that they also have to take care of all the blood vessels, which we feel should be our purview. It's not. We're, we're heavily invested in it and involved in it. But I think to the public, we're a hidden specialty. Our, our identity is not known. Everybody knows what a brain surgeon is, a heart surgeon, a urologist, GYN uh, person. Nobody knows what we are. I feel your pain because I'm a neurologist. And if I mention that at a cocktail party, they say, well, do you do operations? <laughs> it's like some oh. neurologists do procedures now. <laughs> yeah. But that's okay. Whoever does it well should be empowered to do it. And when we applied for our own board, we were going to credential people that may still be general surgeons, but did a vast majority of their work was in vascular. And so we felt that it was the capability of the person, the number of cases they did where their practice was centered would enable them to produce good results and they should be empowered to do it. But that didn't happen. All right. Well, before we wrap up, I have to ask, what's next for you? Uh, doing what I do with the meeting and uh, encouraging and promoting the advancement of young people in our specialty, because I think we owe not, not to them, but we owe a debt to society to keep the specialty going and strong. And that will only come with young people who we support and after training and support. That's fantastic, Dr. Vith. It's, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, your book is on Amazon. I read it. It's great. It's, it's, it's got historical context and a definite uh, message. It's pretty direct. <laughs> it's an enjoyable read. Dr. Vith, I want to thank you very much for joining me on The Art of Medicine. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it very much. Before we close, I'd like to give another thanks to our sponsor, locumstory.com, a resource where providers can get real, unbiased answers about locum tenants. I'm Dr. Andrew Wilner. See you next time. This program is hosted, edited, and produced by Andrew Wilner, MD, FACP, FAAN. Guests receive no financial compensation for their appearance on the art of medicine. Andrew Wilner, MD, is Associate Professor of Neurology at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, Memphis, Tennessee. Views, thoughts, and opinions expressed on this program belong solely to Dr. Wilner and his guests and not necessarily to their employers, organizations, or other group or individual. While this program intends to be informative, it is meant for entertainment purposes only. The Art of Medicine does not offer professional financial, legal, or medical advice. Dr. Wilner and his guests assume no responsibility or liability for any damages, financial or otherwise, that arise in connection with consuming this program's content. Thanks for watching. For more episodes of The Art of Medicine, please subscribe www.andrewwilner.com